Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Emily Sappington, working for Babylon Health today. I'm going to be speaking to you today about setting expectations when designing for artificial intelligence. And we're going to try to slam through this in 20 minutes, so bear with me. My slides are bright. My accent's funny. Let's jump into it. So I want to start off, um, Danny gave me a great introduction. The reason I want to just touch on the resume bit for a second is I've been designing artificial intelligence at lots of different companies um, of varying sizes. So started off at Cortana, then went to a very small British startup called Context Scout, and now I'm at Babylon Health. And the reason I just want to show these is that the lessons I'll be talking to you all today about are scalable across company sizes, from large enterprise to a seed stage startup to something like Babylon, which feels more like a unicorn. And actually, we've got a few people in the house. Can we just get a quick Babylonian shout out, all the Babylon people here? Woo, oh, that was just really pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> There's some waves over there. If you guys are interested, please go talk to them after. So let's face it, I'm here talking to you about AI because it's a buzzword, right? It's been overhyped, it's been over-talked about, and that's why I'm here to talk to you about it today, right? Everybody's interested in it, but they often don't know why. And I find that people come up to me, startup founders, et cetera, and they go, hey, how do I do AI? Or our company really needs to start doing AI in this sort of like desperate, frantic way. And that's so not the way you should think about a tool because that's what AI is. So a lot of founders and people like that, non-designers like all of us, um, tend to think of this when they think of artificial intelligence. They think of, okay, I've got to hire data scientists, I've got to get people on my team who understand the tech, but they don't often think about the experience. And we all are practitioners of user experience, right? So it's our job to care about these things. So I want to set the context for the next few minutes as we speak today. This is a quote from a tech journalist that I thought summed up AI in a wonderful way, because you could spend the 20 minutes just debating what is true AI. But instead, we're going to talk about experiences today. So when we're talking about experiences, the experience of AI, I like this definition, is really about computers doing tasks in a way that we would consider smart. So I like this definition. It gets right at the crux of experiencing AI. So for me, in my career, I like to be inspired by the things around me. If I'm designing touchpad gestures for Windows, I'm gonna look at the way the hand moves. So if I'm designing artificial intelligence, I'm gonna look at the way the human mind perceives intelligence. I'm gonna be inspired by human behavior whenever I can. That's my personal design practice. So when I approach an AI product, I often like to think to myself, well, what makes someone or something smart? And having done this a few times, I started a framework because I realized there were some really predictable elements for how we perceive something as intelligent or smart. This is gonna get a little text heavy, so bear with me. There's really three stages that you go through, and I'm gonna to touch on these one at a time. First and foremost is on the left. Um, when you first encounter another person, or you first encounter a new piece of technology, you're wondering, first, is it even alive? Is it awake? Can I communicate with it? Um, whether that's a human being or a piece of technology. If any of you have children or hang out with kids, you've probably seen them do this. This is the metaphor for what your users do with your products when they first encounter it, right? <laughs> they're not so sure, they're a little tepid, they're trying to see if it's gonna react in some way. And though it's often overlooked, you know, people, when they think about AI, jump to like humanoid robots. But if you get this wrong, you failed. You'll never be intelligent if you don't respond. So the example of this metaphor that I'm pulling out is basically that if you don't respond quickly and responsibly, you're not gonna even seem like your product, or a human, isn't even gonna seem alive and awake and alert. So if you have latency, if you have delays, forget even getting to the point in that scale I showed before of being intelligent. You have to first be responsive. And I know it seems obvious, but this is where I lean into designers kind of being on top of quality control. Testing out your product and making sure that it really does respond in a quick and um, intelligent seeming way in order to get to true intelligence. Okay, so now the middle bit. We've passed the, is it even responding to me phase. Now let's talk about, is it competent? Is this piece of technology competent or is another person competent? So if I were meeting somebody, I might wave at them first and then they'd make eye contact, that's the first stage. The second stage is about, okay, well just general competency. Can I have a conversation? Can I engage with it? So for an example for this one, I dug into some psychological research where I found that students were split into two groups at a university class and they were asked to assess the grade point average of their peers. Um, so their GPAs are usually based on test scores, et cetera, but in the purposes of this study, half of the students were gonna watch interviews of another half, 
and all that they were gonna assess their intelligence or grade point average on was how they conducted these interviews. What was interesting is the students who were interviewed, some of them made eye contact with the camera and were really engaged and talked about their future career aspirations. Others, when they were asked about their career aspirations, would stare at the floor or off the wall. And what was interesting about that is that the students watching their peers evaluated those who were more dynamic speakers, who were making eye contact as being more intelligent and as having higher grades. I certainly can attest to the fact that that's not true with my grade point average, but I think what's interesting about this study is that it was about the perception of intelligence, right? It was about the fact that the one group of students decided that eye contact was the metric and the measure for intelligence. So the reason I like to bring this up is I want people to think about what is that eye contact moment in your products? When can you start to hint at intelligence and competence with your users? So for one of my examples of my last product that I worked on, Context Scout, it was based in the browser. So we kind of followed along with users as they visited websites. And we found that if we messed up in one instance in the first 10 websites they looked at, they would pretty much never use us again. So this involved us digging into the data and looking at the data to understand what users' perceptions of us were and when they dropped off and gave up on us. It was a useful insight for us to figure out, you know what, these first impressions really, really matter. And when I talk about first impressions, for AI in particular and design, there's some skepticism that I'm highlighting because these first two things that we've talked about are really all about users testing your product, looking for you to fail. And the reason I say that is the second you label your product as artificial intelligence, or someone else labels it that more likely, you have set the bar so high. It is really hard to meet that expectation and users are looking for that. See, the thing about this phase is that users are testing your competence and you can use it to your advantage or it can be a disadvantage. On the one hand, you can really wow them. Know that users are gonna come into anything labeled intelligent being quite skeptical. They're gonna go, really? I don't know, I'm gonna try to break it. They're gonna ask things that they think are a little bit outside the bounds. Um, so on the one hand, you can really engage them. I saw this with my product with people that hadn't used Siri for five or six years but then tried Cortana and found it really engaging. But on the other hand, you can really disappoint users. So um, for example, with that same product, Cortana, uh, we shipped reminders. If somebody wasn't able to set a reminder with their voice, a year or two later when we decided, oh, we're gonna ship ordering a pizza with your voice, anybody who'd had a failure point with reminders wasn't gonna trust us with their credit card information to order them a pizza. It was just something that we couldn't jump over that chasm of people just not believing in us. And what this comes down to is it's really all about setting expectations. Um, if anybody's a Netflix fan, you've probably seen this documentary on the Fire Festival. It's less topical now, but this is your example, right? <laughs> when it comes to setting expectations, when you're arguing with your peers about something and saying, you know what, no, it doesn't live up to that user promise, here's your example to go to. Um, setting expectations is so key because people get really upset when you don't meet that bar that you've set. And I think it's really important. I'm not sure how many of us work at startups, but often when you work at a startup, there's this process of crawl, walk, run you know that you're gonna have an MVP to build up to your North Star vision. The problem with startups, as much as I love them, is that often we get into a vernacular tailored at hiring, at uh, appealing to investors, for example, that really overpromises what we can do today. So it's important, I think, as designers to be the ones to set expectations, to be clear with users where we are with the product. Maybe it's doing things like adding a beta tag. Maybe it's just being mindful of not shipping a feature at certain times. At Babylon, we do this as well. We have, we've changed our interface, so this is a bit of a throwback, <laughs> but basically, we had a chat interface and we found it really important to set expectations that though it looks like you're messaging, there's not an actual doctor on the other side because this was AI. So we wanted to remind people of that and set the expectations so we didn't overpromise something. Similarly, again, I'm throwing my old company under the bus for a minute, <laughs> it's important to learn from mistakes. So we shipped the taskbar in Windows 10 to hundreds and hundreds of millions of users with a caption to invite you to click and use Cortana that said, ask me anything. Yeah, I heard some groans. So <laughs> if you've been paying attention thus far, good job, you've realized this was a massive mistake. We've now changed it. The taskbar now says type to search. And that's because the things that we could handle from a natural language input point of view were only a small piece of what users actually asked us when we provoked them to really test our interface and to ask anything possible. So, you may think at this point, okay, it's a bit doom and gloom, right? I've been talking about the negatives of AI, it's a big disappointment, um, all the things that you kind of have to do to lower expectations, but I wanna take this uh, and put it in a positive light for a second because 
I myself am not technological, um, but I enjoy working in tech. And so I wanted to give an example of what happens when you can really dig in as designers and understand the technology and use it to frame your interactions. So my last company, Context Scout, used something called a knowledge graph. It's a bit of an abstract kind of concept, but basically the theory is that those circles are linked together by pieces of information, and every, the lines that you're seeing are relationships between pieces of content. It's a bit distracting, so I'm gonna move on from this. Basically, our company was looking at a web of information, being the internet, and how it was all interconnected. At Babylon, we have the same kind of thing. It's just symptoms and conditions and diseases, and how those are interconnected. This is as technical as it's gonna get, guys, don't worry. So, um, the, the outcome of this is that, I just took a couple screenshots from our product back in the day, um, that the same person would have different outputs. Sometimes the website was taken down, sometimes things changed on the internet, and so the fact that we were using that data from the internet meant it wasn't reliable. So, the same information wasn't there every time, which for me as a designer was an absolute nightmare. Like, not reliable information, not knowing what's gonna come up in the interface is really tricky. So what we decided to do is then instead plan a design where as we found things, they popped forward in a more delightful way. We didn't want something that showed what we couldn't find or what we found in the past but we didn't find this time. So I designed the interface strictly around what we could and couldn't do and it resulted in a more delightful and pleasant experience because it just popped up along people's workflows. And I think this is a good example of times where you need to dig into the tech with your peers and understand what the constraints are rather than some dynamics that I've seen in workplaces where People speak of AI more as like a magical unicorn that's gonna solve everything. It's good to work with your peers and understand the limitations of the technology so you can work and design within it, right? Designers love constraints. This is something we do. Okay, so back to this table. We've been talking about competence, we've been talking about setting user expectations, but I wanna conclude more to speaking about intelligence and delight, the fun part of AI. So when I speak to people about what they consider smart, I found that applications of AI really fell into two camps that I wanna walk you through today. First off is really um, imitating human behavior. So this is when Alexa tells a joke and you're like, damn, that's pretty funny. Or a humanoid robot that scares you a little bit, but it actually does look pretty realistic. Or maybe it's my favorite example, um, the Google Duplex when it made a phone call. If any of you have heard the demo, it's fantastic. There's AI basically speaking to a human, and when the human says, just wait a minute, the AI goes, mm-hmm, which is fantastic. These are the moments that are all about imitating human behavior. On the other side, we have more practical uses of AI that provide unique value. And this might be, this is a Watson dashboard. It could be Google helping fill in your emails because it's learned the way you write emails and giving you suggestions. Or maybe it's taking a task that people do at their job and doing it for them really quickly. It's important to think about the latter half of what I've just spoken about because a lot of companies that work in AI are actually playing in this space. We all think we're playing around with humanoid robots, but very few organizations have the budget, the funding, and frankly, any good reason to do so. So it's important if we're gonna be in that latter half of AI to remember that winning moments can be both big and small. Um, our AI symptom checker did result in telling me I had tonsillitis, and sure enough, I really did, which was great because I didn't have to go through as much work with my doctor. For me, that was magical, but someone who doesn't understand that there's AI behind it would just see regular UI when they look at this. It's important to remember that smart moments, smart moments are in the eyes of the beholder. So your users find things more valuable often than you. My last company did more B2B work. So this bar graph was something that I noticed people drawing on pieces of paper as they looked through LinkedIn. It was something that we could automate in half a second, and it saved them a few minutes of work. So for them, the aha moment was the time that they had back. That is really magical for users, and it's not a humanoid robot, but it is AI. So I wanna arm you all, designers and practitioners of user experience, how do you handle when someone comes up to you and says, so how do we do AI, in a really frantic tone? Well, I want you to first think about lessons for large and small companies. It's all about setting expectations appropriately, it's about making sure that you're, if you're gonna claim intelligence, you go above and beyond the user expectations. Two thirds of the sections I walked through were all about meeting the bar of being competent, and then you can go tackle being intelligent. Then, of course, it's about doing a few things well if you're gonna take this on, really scope and focus. So for scenarios specific, for startups specifically, get scenario focused. It's a massive help, um, and use voice, for instance, only if your scenario, devices, and environment all support it. Um, and personify only if it's helpful to you. If we have a minute, I was gonna just play a quick audio clip. Hopefully the audio will behave. Um, at Babylon right now, we're building our first Alexa skill. So I wanted to show you how we're nudging into personification without being overly uh, full of personality, 
we took some decisions to do so in a measured way, and I'll play you a sample. Okay, that's done. You will be receiving an email now. The doctor will be calling you on the Babylon Health app at 8 p.m. today. You will get a reminder 10 minutes before your appointment. If you need to change or cancel your appointment, please ask me anytime. Take care. So the thing I wanted to pause on is the last two words, take care. We had a lot of things that we had to get through, sort of utilitarian things that we needed to say to the user. We didn't want to go above and beyond and go, hope it's a wonderful appointment, feel better, because we don't know, honestly. We don't know if our users will feel better. So because it's our first Alexa skill, we're taking a, a step into this space in a really gentle and subtle way, and I think that's the appropriate way to wade into showing off artificial intelligence. Remember that sometimes to do AI correctly, it means saying no to engineers. Um, they probably hate that I put this up, but basically my old company developed a chatbot while I went away on vacation, and I came back, tested it, and it just failed miserably. So designers have to say no. Designers have to be the ones that put their feet down and say, you know what? No, this is not at the bar of being competent, let alone intelligent. It's important for us to be the ones that keep an eye on that bar of expectation. And sometimes it means building rails into your experience. At Babylon, we love natural language. We have some of the best natural language engineering around, but we also don't want to fail and fall on our faces. So it means, at times, we're gonna guide the conversation, right? We're gonna give multiple choice options rather than letting people type anything in because it helps us have a successful outcome. It keeps the conversation moving in a way that we can manage. I wanna say with AI, I don't know if anybody else is a Parks and Rec fan, but when you develop your AI, you might notice that for us, Cortana's, or, um, sorry, Babylon's assistant said, take care. It's good to be thoughtful, it's good to be cooperative with your users, so you don't wanna be the Ron Swanson of AI. You don't wanna be a jerk and be unhelpful. This seems obvious, but if you do some research on the cooperative principles and other things, you'll see that the best delivery of artificial intelligence is really about making users feel smart and competent. It's about saving them time and effort, as I spoke to you about the B2B scenarios. And it lets them use their brains for what they're best at. Um, it doesn't make too rigid of a path for them to walk down, but it instead helps them back on board as to what they should be doing and to help have a positive outcome. The example I like to show here, and I'm not sure if the text is working, but your users have a much broader expectations of what they can say to you. This is why we use multiple choice in that example, right? We may only be able to understand one part of it, but what users are going to say and deliver could be all over the place. And it's good to be aware of that and to know that. You have to be humble in understanding that your users aren't going to be perfect, right? Everything all of us have dealt with that so far is that we have delivered a product and had it used in a completely different way. So it's our job as designers, in terms of setting expectation, to try to scope exactly how we're gonna keep them within the rails of the conversation. One way that you can do that is to show users that you understand that they're trying to test you a little bit. With Cortana, we put a lot of time and effort into the jokes and understanding the things that people would say. Uh, for example, some users would type in, who's your daddy? And Cortana had a really clever answer for, well, it's Bill Gates. And it was really clever, and it was our way of showing, yeah, we know that you're testing us. And so this is a chance to have fun. We, this is a few jokes that we put up for Cortana before, uh, when people would ask it to be their girlfriend, we just sort of knew that it wasn't only gonna be a productivity tool, that people were poking and looking for times that we would fail. So it's good to have responses and answers for that. So in closing, we think about minimum viable intelligence. It's really about doing a few things very well. So if you're working for a startup, this is critical. Don't expect to be intelligent before you're smart. Know that you have to make sure there's no delays, there's no lags, there's no issues in order to deliver on AI. Always under-promise and over-deliver, and surprise users with intelligence that suits your scenario. That's my time, thanks guys. I'm gonna say one more thing, if that's okay. Feel free. <laughs> um, at Babylon Health, we wanted to offer a gift to everybody at UX Brighton, so if you'd like a free GP appointment, feel free to register and use this code for a free GP appointment. I hope no one's having any cold symptoms, but it's a good time of year for this. If you'd like to speak to us, we're hiring, so come find me or any of my colleagues. Thanks, everybody. Thank